preparing Zoom. Okay, webinar is now streaming live on Facebook. Very good. Hi world. So, here we go. So yeah, hi world, how's it going? Um, so my name is uh, Jeremy Johnson. I will be facilitating this session. Um, what um, are you an empath? And so first, let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing here. Uh, we're collaborating with Evolve and Ascend, and we are Neuro Learning. Uh, Neuro is an online educational community dedicated to transformational learning, creating containers for immersive contemplation on the spiritual path and a deep dive opportunities for knowledge on, sub on subjects like meditation, personal transformation, healing, and spiritual growth. Most of all, we're a budding community of seekers and consciousness explorers. So tonight I am joined by uh, David Savage and Henrietta Weeks. Uh, Henrietta is my colleague with Neuro and we've been creating this wonderful class uh, with everybody um, for, with David. And let me give David's intro really quick for everybody. Uh, so David Savage is a, a professional empath who is singled out in The Guardian as a master of his craft. Uh, he is capable of emptying out his nervous system and tuning into people on command absorbing their emotions fully and providing deep insight into their lives and returning to himself safely, all thanks to the methods that he's going to be sharing with you a little bit during this session and during our actual class, our three-part class. Uh, he has performed empathic readings everywhere from art galleries to virtual reality to the middle of Times Square. And recently he taught uh, how to thrive as an empath on Evolver uh, Learning Lab to glowing reviews. And students reported that just by taking the class, they felt centered and empowered. Uh, David is a shaman by nature and he doesn't just present information. He creates transformational experiences. And Henrietta and I, myself, um, we can definitely vouch for that. So yeah, David will be joining us on March 7th, 11th and 14th for a three-part online intensive school for empaths where you'll learn everything you need to know about protecting yourself and unlocking your superpower. So uh, I wanna welcome you, David. Uh, thanks for joining us on Evolve and Ascend in this uh, neuro learning collaborative live stream. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Henrietta. I'm happy to be here. I'm a fan of Evolve and Ascend and I'm excited about uh, the class we're doing together. Wonderful. So, so why don't we start with, with uh, the most elementary question. First of all, what, what exactly is an empath? That is a great question. Uh, and it tends to be a word that people use having a vague intuitive understanding of it without actually a clear definition. I, I personally like the following definition. An empath is somebody who experiences the emotions of other people. That's my definition. I'm going to say that again. An empath is somebody who experiences the emotions of other people in his or her own body. For example, you walk into a room and you suddenly feel sad. You don't know why you feel sad. There doesn't seem to be a reason for you to feel sad. And then as you look around the room, you see that somebody else is sad. And now it makes sense. This is different than your emotions being triggered by somebody. So if you see somebody sad, that might make you feel anxious because you want to do something about their sadness. Or it might make you feel sad to see that somebody else is in pain. These are perfectly legitimate and common experiences. But that is not what I mean when I say you are an empath. An empath means that you are actually having the emotional experience of another human being. Um, the process by which that emotion jumps from that person to you uh, is totally unknown and mysterious. The fact that it does is totally real. Um, then, uh, well, that's, so that's my definition. I want to give um, a tip of the hat to other definitions that you'll encounter out there uh, in the internet or popularly. Um, a woman named Judith Orloff, who has written several books on empaths and who I respect and is a psychiatrist, she defines an empath as a sponge who absorbs the emotions, energies, and physical symptoms of others. So it's not just emotions, it's also energy, whatever we mean by that, and then physical symptoms. So you could be, let's call it a physical empath where somebody is in physical pain and you start to feel that pain. Um, that 
in scientific terms is getting to be known. That's called mirror touch synesthesia, where you have a physical experience of somebody else's physical experience. Um, so that bleeds into what an empath is. And then the last definition I wanna offer is the original definition. Um, and this definition comes by way of a 1956 short story called The Empath, which is the first ever use of the word empath. And in that story, an empath is like a telepath, except instead of it's with thoughts, it's with physical and emotional experiences. So somebody who has telepathy can tune into and hear another person's thoughts. Somebody who has telepathy can also instill thoughts in another. An empath is the same, except it's physical and emotional and sensorial. So they can feel what's going on in another and they can also transmit what's going on to another. Um, so there you have three definitions of an empath. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, so what is the difference between, let's say, somebody who's a highly sensitive HSP uh, mm -hmm. and an empath? Is there a difference? Is there an overlap? Yeah, so uh, there is a difference and there is an overlap. Uh, unlike the word empath, a highly sensitive person has a definition that has come through psychology. So the word empath does not originate in psychology, it originates in science fiction. Highly sensitive person originates with a psychologist, uh, Elaine, excuse me, I forgot her name. Um, and she's being very specific. A highly sensitive person is someone who has extremely sensitive nervous system and is easily overwhelmed by stimuli. Um, there are many people who are both highly sensitive and empathic. There are also people who are highly sensitive and not empathic. And there are people who are empathic or who are empaths and who are not highly sensitive. Though I would say the overlap is probably something like 50%. Um, the difference would be that, uh, let's say you were highly sensitive, but you were not an empath. It would be very, very difficult for you to be in a subway with lots of stimuli and people around, but it not, might not be so difficult for you to be around one person who's having an emotional breakdown that might not stir up anything in you. By contrast, if you were an empath, but you were not highly sensitive, it might be very, very difficult to be around somebody who's having an intense emotional experience. But in the subway, if it's relatively calm, your nervous system might be fine. Um, I'm probably pretty far along on the empath scale, uh, and I waver about whether or not I'm highly sensitive. I'm, if I'm highly sensitive, I'm certainly on the less sensitive side of highly sensitive. Um, that makes sense. Definitely, yeah, I, I can I can definitely see some some nuances there and, and distinctions. Um, so, how does somebody come to know? Because we're getting actually some comments in the Facebook uh, thread right now. Uh, some people are saying, uh, "Yes, I'm an empath." And so, um, how does somebody come to know? Because we're getting actually some comments there in the Facebook uh, sorry uh, about thread right okay. now. Uh, some people are saying. Uh, yes, I'm an empath. One second. And I'm so, how does out. somebody come to know? Because we're getting actually. This is not possible. There we go. <laughs> okay. It's all good. I, yeah, that's a weird thing about the live stream. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, uh, somebody, Josh, hi, Josh. He's saying, I'm an empath. Hi, Josh. An empath is a, is a human not broken by the conditioning of a controlling system of dissatisfaction and dissociation. Interesting. I um, disagree then, with you, Josh. Um, I think many empaths are broken. <laughs> and I think many non, uh, I think, uh, um, I, th I think maybe to the part I want to agree with the gist of what you're saying is that empathic abilities come online as you undo some of the brokenness of our culture that's come into our bodies. Um, but I, I want to, um, I think most empaths are probably deeply pained um, and quite broken for the most part, more broken than most because they're so sensitive and what is going on emotionally in the field is so toxic. So maybe this is a good lead into the next question and that is how do you know that you're an empath? You have found yourself inexplicably overwhelmed in the presence of people having intense emotional experiences. That's one way. 
you find yourself drained in some like deep, like you're missing way after you've had uh, several emotional encounters, like something in you has been taken out of you. You're gone. Um, Or that's on the kind of, let's call it the negative side of the spectrum. On the positive side of the spectrum, you have this deep knowing that you can't put your finger on as to what somebody needs emotionally. Uh, Oh, wow. Even you're aware that you're feeling, this might not even be in your head, but your body, you're feeling the anxiety of another person. And because you're having their anxiety in your own body, you just know intuitively what to do about it. Uh, You have an incredible gift for working with other people's emotions. I would say, I, I would imagine that most great teachers are empaths. Um, most great people facing people, a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them are empaths. You're also the one that, you tend to be the one that people want to tell their problems to, want help figuring out how to navigate emotional situations. And you might not know why they're always coming up to you. It just ends up being your role. You're probably an empath. Are, Are empaths, are you born this way? Is this kind of like a, a gift that you're born with? Can this develop? Is there, is there something that can happen in your life, like a, a traumatic experience, perhaps a spiritual awakening that can, that can kind of catalyze becoming an empath? Or is this something you're born with? My hunch is that 100% of human beings are born empaths. Uh, but we are still born on a spectrum. So some people are going to be naturally more sensitive to the, or naturally more naturally absorb the experiences of others. And others are going to naturally less absorb the experience of others. And that that tendency is inherent, inborn, genetic, no choice. I have black hair, that kind of thing, where you are naturally on the empathic spectrum. However, I think we are all 100% of us, um, unless we're raised in a tribe that cares, everyone else, we are, our empathic abilities shrink. Um, Our culture disincentivizes empathy uh, and parents don't have the tools to support empathic children. And so we learn that something is off in us and we shut down, or even if we're not mishandled as children, and who isn't, um, we don't necessarily get the tools or the training. Nobody's around to teach us what to do. And so in my case, and probably many other empaths, we absorb all this stuff, and we just literally don't know what to do with it. Um, If you have, for instance, a accounting problem, You know exactly who to go to in this world. And many, many, many people will be able to solve it for you. And almost everybody will be able to tell you who they know who can solve it. But if you have a problem because you absorb too many people's energies in a day and you are now overwhelmed and you are afraid of going into work the next day, who are you going to call? Where in the culture is there like authority figures? What are you going to do? So there's just not a culture that empowers and teaches so okay so we've kind of gone over what it means to be an empath or or how do you know that you're an empath and i would love to hear from everybody listening on on uh the live stream on facebook if you identify with being an empath and how you came you learned that you were um so maybe we can go into uh (laughs) you, you mentioned this a little earlier why 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 are there empaths? What's going on with, with uh, if we're all kind of born with this innate capacity, what is it about being an empath? I think, um, I don't know, is, is there a kind, is this a kind of evolutionary mutation? Is this mm. a sort of like the baseline for what humanity should be? So mm. why, why, why are we here? The reason, the reason um, we were all, we are all, I believe, at the bottom, maybe with the exception of a few sociopaths, Uh, But the reason why I think we are all at bottom feeling or capable of feeling other people's feelings in our body is because it's a way of connecting us with other people. So it's a, it's a kind of social glue. 
it's not dissimilar from our innate ability to read people's emotions on their face. If somebody's smiling, we all know that they're happy. Well, actually, no, because you could be smiling and be unhappy. You could be faking it. So the empath has this extra way of getting information, keeping us connected on a deeper level. Why I think some people like me and probably like many of the people on this live stream and like many of the people who will take this class, which I hope you'll sign up for, why I think there are people on the far end of the spectrum uh, is because we are meant to be in touch with the underlying reality of a given dynamic. We have the opportunity then to bring it up to the forefront and look at it with a kind of clarity that non-empaths wouldn't be able to have. And we also, if we have done enough work on ourselves and have enough support ourselves, can hold the emotional experience of others and allow it to pass through them if they cannot do that on their own. These, I think, are the two probably of many reasons why this archetype of the empath exists. So maybe this is a good point to, to touch in on a little bit of the origin of the word as we were doing before we got started. Um, in terms of where did this come from in culture and when did it first originate? Because I know you love yeah. introducing this and this is great too. I, it did, I talked about it a little bit. Um, it originated in a 1956 short story called The Empath by a now relatively obscure Scottish novelist and short story writer named J.T. McIntosh. Um, and, you know, you, you won't find it anywhere. I mean, you, you'll find it if you look for New World's Fiction number 50 uh, and you buy it on Amazon or Aid Books. Um, and uh, um, it certainly has never been republished in the modern age. The story, you won't find it online. Nobody's, nobody's providing it. Um, but here it is, The Empath. And... Uh, it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's an iteration of the idea of a telepath. Um, and it seems to, it seems to have wanted to come through this, this man. And, and as soon as he wrote it, it started to get copied. Other people started writing about empaths and Star Trek picked it up and really popularized it 10 years later. Um, it seems to have hit the, the mark. It's like science fiction doesn't tell us about the future. It tells us about aspects of the present that we haven't looked at enough. Um, it brings attention to underlying themes. Now, um, the, the 1950s, I think about the 1950s, and here I'm going to go on a, a, a semi-BS, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'll just speculate for the hell of it, rant. Um, there seemed to be at least in this country, like these two intense countervailing pressures. There was this huge pressure to conform. Um, and we have this, this crystal clear vision of the ideal 1950s. And then the excitement was the beginning of allowing the undercurrents to emerge. It wasn't the 60s where things blew up. It was the beach generation. It was like, hey, like let's pop through with change. How do we get there? What does it look like? I don't know. And in that period, culturally, that's when the empath as an idea emerges, somebody who can source what is really going on and bring it to the fore. Um, but that's just me. That's just me doing some really amateur literary historical analysis that people who do that for a living can happily mock me for. <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. And what you're doing is definitely um, a fascination of mine as well that we'll probably get more into awesome. during the class. Um, but Jeffrey Kripal has written some great books about the connection between science fiction and the consciousness revolution and how they were really kind of intertwined at that cultural period. So I think you're really on to something. Um, so we got a few questions. Um, first, here we, here we go. And everybody who's on the live stream, we're reading your questions. So we'll definitely be able to tie them in here. And you can definitely ask them uh, to David as we go along. So. First of all, uh, Jessica, thanks so much for your comments here. Uh, she says, my mom taught me I was an empath because I've always been very sensitive and have hard, a hard time watching the news. Mm -hmm. I also can't be around negativity or I will have anxiety. So that's, that's kind of an interesting question, I guess, kind of answering how do you know or how did you know that you were an empath? 
Um, is that a phenomenon too? Just not being able to deal with the kind of 24 hour newsreel of just, you know, alarm bells going on, you know, constantly. Um, I, it depends. It depends. I don't know. And it's hard. I, I don't own the word empath and it's, it's, people attach to it because it can mean something like highly sensitive to intense experiences. And that's a totally legitimate use of the word. I, I don't mind. Um, as I think about it, it's like you're watching the news and there's this toxic like stuff coming at you. And then uh, you got to go like this, you got to push it away. I think that's, that sounds, that sounds like a fine use of the word empath to me. It's like I'm absorbing something. Um, then like, like uh, um, if I look at people who are filled with hatred, I start to recoil. Uh, I feel that. Yeah. So we've got a good question and I think this is the next logical one. Uh, how do you protect yourself as an empath? Well, that's a great question. And um, I will give you some really quick tips. I will say that this is a very deep question with lots of layers to it. And this is exactly why uh, we are doing the course is to cover this um, and, to, and, and to give you everything I know about it and to keep pointing you in directions that will be helpful. Uh, I'm just going to give you my top three of many. First and most important way to protect yourself as an empath is to remove yourself physically from spaces where you feel overwhelmed by other people's experiences. It's so obvious, but actually people don't do it. So if you're like, I can't deal, I can't deal, that's a very legitimate experience. Remove yourself from the situation and recover and take time. That's number one. Number two is to imagine a bubble around yourself. And literally close your eyes and you can visualize as I'm doing at this very moment, kind of force field or bubble. And you can give that bubble through practice, whatever qualities you want. So I can say to this bubble, I want nothing of anybody else to come through. And you'll feel something harden in yourself and you'll feel protected in there. Uh, some things may still come through, but my hunch is for most people, much, much less will come through. And the more you do it, the less and less will come through. Um, and let's see, the third thing I want to say is that um, it's really good to practice different techniques and try stuff out. So what works for me, I've noticed just empirically doesn't work for other people. Uh, and that's totally cool. It's like we're different strokes for different folks. Even different empaths can have two vastly different ways of protecting themselves. So I would totally recommend Googling. How do I protect myself as an empath? You will find lots of different techniques. If one resonates for you, it's resonating because it probably would work. Give it a try. And take my class. <laughs> yes. Yes. Actually, that's that's one of the topics of our, of our class sessions. It's um, protection and creating healthy boundaries and starting learning to work like that. Um, so, so yeah, pa Paul is mentioning on Facebook, uh, I push out a force field bu bubble from my belly and encapsulate my whole body. Works good. Cool, Paul. Um, and PA is mentioning that, um, okay, so he's, he's sharing a little story here. I fell down a second floor, uh, I fell down through a second floor, head down when I was around 10, I saw my laugh, life flash before me. Once I opened my eyes and saw I was alive and hanging on my left leg on a clothesline. Um, since then, I absorbed a lot of energy and vibration. Many times while I drive, I go uh, pass under a street light pole, will turn off. And then since the incident, I've started to have visions, started to see colors. And that's when I discovered the aura. So yeah, that's, that's, you know, that was part of my question earlier can experiences like that kind of open you? <laughs> Apparently the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, and yeah, please, everyone, keep sharing with us your stories, your questions. Yes, I love um, questions. Uh, I, I, I want to hear more questions. Yes. So chime in on the Facebook page. 
And um, while we're waiting, perhaps this is a good time to ask, uh, what would be a good way if you are not an empath or if you know an empath, how do you work with them? How do you give them the space? If uh, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a close friend, how do you work with, with the empath and empathize with what they're experiencing? So empaths, uh, I have noticed, and this goes for myself too, are not good at expressing their limits or boundaries. Um, we are not good at expressing our limits or boundaries because our emotional well-being is so frequently tied up with the emotional well-being of another that we naturally incline toward regulating other people's emotions, even at the risk of our own life essence. So you will likely discover, if you are in a relationship with an empath, that they are shutting down unpredictably, that they are having reactions to what's going on that you can't make sense of. This might be extremely frustrating and it might contradict what it is they say. They might say, oh, I want to go out. And then their whole body is screaming, I don't want to go out. So your job, should you choose to accept it, if you are in a loving relationship with an empath, is to pay really, really, really close attention to when they start to waver or shut down or get overwhelmed and to help them articulate those moments better to you so that you guys are working together around their unspoken boundaries. And as you collectively get better at feeling out where those boundaries are and respecting those boundaries, you will find that the empath has so much more to give so much more to give. Great answer, thank you. So we've got a couple more questions now. Um, so Tamara is asking, David, how did you realize that you were an empath? Uh, I don't know when I actually realized that. I don't know when I started to use that word. Um, I will, however, answer it by saying that I plant medicine, in particular ayahuasca, uh, was m my initiation into this, into what it is to be an empath. I may have already known it on some level when I started taking ayahuasca, but the ayahuasca showed me the degree to which I was carrying other people's emotions in my body. And she taught me how to embrace that truth and then work with other people's emotions. In fact, I would say a lot of what I am teaching in this class was given to me if I had a teacher by ayahuasca. Um, so uh, Jennifer was asking about um, because this comes up a lot, quite a lot, the, the empath and narcissist connection. Uh, and and uh, gosh, the relationship between being an empath and, and empaths and narcissists, because there's a kind of, like you said, empaths don't often ask or are good at setting their boundaries, right? So maybe, and I've seen a few articles recently. So why, okay, two things about the empath and narcissist. One, um, a lot of what is generating the interest in empaths and narcissists online is a lot of anger at men who don't take into account women's needs. And that turns into the story of, I'm an empath, i.e. I am good, and he's a narcissist, i.e. he is bad. Um, and it's a way for women who have not yet learned how to work with their own vulnerability and set limits um, to externalize their frustration out in the culture with these loaded terms. I uh, felt nice to say. Okay, that said, they are in that there also is a vein of truth if we can remove the judgment 
And the truth is, is that empaths tend to have an endless need to give and narcissists tend to have an endless need to take. Uh, the problem is that the word empath is more neutral, if not positive, and the word narcissist is super, super negative. So this is not a very balanced, not a very balanced equation. What's really going on underneath all this is in the empath thing is that somebody who has a compulsive need to give and who has not yet figured out how to take care of themselves is surrendering themselves to somebody who has a compulsive need to take and who has not yet figured out how to give. And so they are meeting each other in a perfectly equal uh, but unhealthy dynamic. Fascinating. Yeah, there's this, some folks agreeing in the in the chat here. Um, interesting. Jessica saying, "I'm not feeling the narcissist word." Me neither. Empaths, empaths are codependent and fuel the narcissist. Okay, empaths are neither codependent nor not codependent. You can be a codependent empath or not a codependent empath. Um, there are plenty of empaths. I am not a codependent. But there are plenty of empaths who are codependent. Uh, the narcissist word is somebody who, I mean, a, a, a narcissist in the conventional sense is somebody who's endlessly obsessed with themselves. Um, on a deeper sense, in a deeper sense, is somebody who's, comp who's incapable of experiencing the needs of others as legitimate uh, because on a deep, deep level, they have never experienced their own needs as legitimate. So they're hurting. Um, hmm. yeah, can I just say so, that in the class that you taught when before, I, I really liked how you dissolved these barriers, you know, dissolved the stories around the narcissist and empath relationship and kind of got it on a more equal footing as a sort of flow of energy and how to work with that. So that I, yeah, I read, cause this is kind of new territory. Yeah. Um, oh, you froze there, Henrietta. I hope I didn't freeze. Am I still here? Yeah. You're here, we're, we're here. Okay. Um, Henrietta is joining us from yeah, far away in Mexico with maybe a slightly shaky internet. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, slightly shaky internet only tonight, but um, I just did want to say that, that, you know, that this is something that David really helped me with in the class and all the other participants are just talking about these kind of relationships that are very much out there in the media at the moment in a different way, coming at it from a sort of more helpful way, really, and not labeling things positive and negative. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm just like, I'm a narcissist the word has some meaning from a psychological standpoint, but that meaning is so lost because what we mean by it when we say it is a, is a bastard who doesn't care about anybody but himself. And that is not a, that is not a useful yes. way of looking at a human being. Yeah, exactly. So we're getting some great questions um, from Kim and, and Jessica. And so Jessica has like a two-parter. Because uh, she mentioned that she was wondering what jobs and careers are good for empaths. Mm. Uh, she says, I feel like the jobs I should be in, like public service, have me needing to unwind for more than three hours after I get home from work. And I know, David, you, you're going to go over during our class some techniques to really help help you work with that. Um, but it's a great question. What, uh, what, what do you do uh, if you're an empath? How do you work? Uh, okay. So... I have this thought was coming up in your question. Thank you for that question. In the ideal world we don't live in, we honor the empaths need to reset in the careers that they are most inclined to. So if you're a teacher and you're a great teacher because you are so in tune with the class wouldn't it be nice if you got 45 minutes off between classes every time and somebody thought like that? If you're a really great therapist, partly because you know how to tune in, can you learn to make the space? Or have you been through so many different dynamics that you didn't choose to be in without anyone giving a crap about your energy 
that you're now all drained. So unfortunately, a lot of the careers that most drain empaths are archetypally right for them. It's just that the way that our society structures these careers is deeply wrong, um, which makes it all the more important to figure out how to set boundaries, uh, be clear about what you can and can't do, release all the stuff you pick up and protect yourself. Uh, if you are drawn to public service, but you are afraid that it will drain you, I think you val let's, I want to validate both sides of that equation. That draw is real, and that is probably uh, a healthy impulse that wants to be honored. And your fear is real because you are afraid of getting drained. Learn how to protect yourself, and then you'll find yourself going where you're called. Thank you. So yeah, she was, Jessica was mentioning, she just says yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, she also mentioned, yeah, working with the public makes me feel incredibly overwhelmed and depressed, but it's contradicting considering that that's what I should be doing it, if it's my gift. What if um, you were to work with people on a smaller scale, like take it, take it bite size, give your all to one person for an hour and don't schedule anything after that and feel how that felt. Did you feel inspired and then drained? Great, what do we do about the drains part? And then learn to work with that and then try seeing two people and test your limits. And I also hear there's something be aware of. Um, this, is, this is not specific to empaths, what I'm about to say. Be cognizant of the possibility that your concept of what you ought to be doing is not coming from within. It's coming from some sense of what is right for you drop down on you by the culture or by an authority figure. Um, and going toward that thing you feel like you should be doing uh, might be just a way of telling yourself you suck. And if you started to tell yourself you don't suck, you might find that you end up going in another direction. She says, that's a good idea. Um, okay, thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, Jessica, for your questions. Um, so here's an interesting one. Uh, Kim Kimberly was asking, is being an empath more of a, f a feminine energy? And what's yes. the relationship between feminine and masculine energy here? Being an empath is a feminine energy, or it's a, uh, it's a, it's a receptivity. Um, it's an allowing. It's, a, it's like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm in a kind of spacious, subtle place when I'm at my most open. It's 100% a feminine gift. The masculine role is what I'm playing in a sense right now on this live stream. I am creating a safe space for that feminine quality. So uh, Kong is asking, what is the difference between being an empath and an energy vampire? I imagine there's a very big difference between the two. Uh, an energy vampire, well, first of all, these social media words that pop up, like the narcissism and energy vampire, they can't be used as words in the way that we can use the word empath as a word, because energy vampire means immediately someone who is a terrible person draining your life, draining you of your life force. So that, that word itself is so full of contempt. Um, so I'm gonna try to strip the contempt out of it and say that there are people who naturally in their current state tend to drain people of their energy by virtue of their neediness. Um, so the kind of neediness where you're need to take people's energy into you in order to feel whole. Um, and if the people from whom you're taking energy don't know how to protect themselves or don't feel confident in themselves, they will give it of themselves. So uh, an empath is not 
in it's so there could be an empath who's an energy vampire it's a perfectly possible combination but an empath is not taking energy from somebody he is experiencing their energy it's not depleting if i'm reading someone i'm not depleting them i'm tuning into them and allowing it and in this sense um, an empath operates on the unconscious assumption that energy as we know it is is infinite i don't take energy from you by tuning into it and experiencing it it's not happening in that linear fashion uh, the energy vampire premise is that somehow energy is limited and I suck it out of you, which is probably wrong, which is probably why this contempt is so uh, useless. Um, an energy vampire could just as easily be seen as somebody showing you where you are not yet clear in your own boundaries. And what a gift that energy vampire is to teach you that. Great answer. Yeah. And it's, it's very important to kind of break down these social media words. I love how you framed it that way. Uh, because they're just buzzwords that kind of get tossed around. But what does that really, what does that really mean? It means that guy sucks because after <laughs> I hung out with him, I felt weak. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. And folks, we're, we're taking questions from the Facebook page. So um, if you've got one. Oh, okay. So here we go. Yeah, please keep your questions coming in. We've still got a little bit of time here. We'd love to hear from you and what you think of this. Um, are you an empath? Do you feel like you, uh, how do you, how did you learn you were an empath? And of course, we're talking about our, our class, which is coming up on March 7th, 11th, and 14th. It's a three-part class. Um, we'll be going into all of this in much more detail with David. But uh, Kim is saying, um, how do you feel about palm reading, energy reading? Is all of that real? To me, there are three kinds of psychics. Psychics who are completely full of it and just want to take your money and know it. Psychics who believe themselves but have no genuine gifts, but just have convinced themselves that they're doing something. And psychics who are totally legit. Uh, I do believe that there are people who can genuinely see into the future. I do believe that there are people who can tune into you through your palm. I don't know whether these lines mean anything, um, but I believe that there are people who are capable of holding your hand and knowing things that are deeply true. So that's what I think. Yeah. Um, so we got another one from Thomas asking about uh, what, uh, okay, so he's asking about chakras, and, and do chakras, are chakras at all associated with this ability of being an empath? Yeah, um, so there, we can leak energy from chakras, and chakras can also get stuck. Chakras can attract energy that isn't ours. So if you have a, um, if you have a dysfunctional sexual relationship, uh, you can't that that like your second chakra can then be blocked with the energy of the person with whom you've had that relationship. And as you clear it, you might literally feel a release from that place. Uh, your heart. I mean, you can look at um, like if, if a relationship is still weighing you down, part of this could certain like, let's say you break up with somebody, but the, re but that relationship is preventing you from reconnecting Part of that could certainly be a broken heart in the conventional sense, like you are hurting and you are grieving. But also part of it could be that some of their energy is still here and you need to cut the cord and release it. And it's literally, literally, I believe if we could look at it enough, we would see their energy literally on your heart. Um, so yeah, I definitely think there's an interplay between these, these different ways of looking at it. Emotional, energetic, uh, chakra, physical, And yeah, that's that's a follow up from Kong too. He's asking, uh, why do you believe visual protection techniques work? Love that question. Never been asked. Because it's all a hologram anyway. <laughs> uh it's it's a um 
everything is ultimately information. Um, not in necessarily the sense of ones and zeros. I think information at its core is something much more beautiful and magical than binary. But the reason that it works is because we are creating with our unconscious and we are creating with our minds not in the secret sense of if I envision a Lamborghini, it will come to me, but on a, on a much subtler energetic sense that these visualizations make clearer to us. Yeah, we got another question. Uh, I'm going to talk question more so I can come up with a better answer. I yeah. Really that one. Yes, uh, Kim is asking about white light. Do, we use, do you use white light at all in your visualizations? Yeah, sometimes I call in a white light to protect myself or sometimes even like the divine white light of God, I'll even say. Uh, and I will see a, a white mist quality over my whole body and it feels very protective and it works very well for a lot of people. It does work for me. Excellent. So maybe we can mention here too, you know, we're going, going to be having a class next month for anybody joining us uh, right now. We're talking about um, what being an empath means, uh, exploring if you are an empath. And um, so maybe we can go over a little bit of our, our sessions for next month, right? So we, got, we have three sessions. Uh, what are the kinds of things students should expect if they sign up? What will they be uh, learning? Yeah, I, uh, first I'm going to really go into much greater detail about how do you know if you're an empath? What is an empath? I'm going to trace the origin of the word, uh, which is really empowering. I, I found it really empowering. I hadn't read anywhere that the word originated in this sci-fi book. And I've now done the work of not just reading this sci-fi book, but reading a bunch of subsequent uh, articles um, and sci-fi stories around empaths. So I'm really rooted in this word and it's empowering to know where it comes from as I go out with it. And then we'll also be covering the all the ways that work really well for me about how to protect myself and all the ways that are out there that I found that I see how they work or they sometimes work for me that I'll bring up. We'll be doing it experientially. I won't just be talking about it. We'll be playing with it, learning from it, sharing. Uh, for instance, one technique I don't do very much of but keeps coming up is using animals to cleanse yourself. People, uh, empaths, not me, but many empaths find that if they spend time with a, with a loving dog, they are naturally cleansed. So we'll be sourcing ideas like this from the internet and from other people in the class. And I guarantee you that one of these things will change your life. One of these things will make you go, oh, okay, this really works for me. Um, and you'll also find that by creating a space for empaths to learn and grow, you will just start knowing things. Like we are opening the portal here and ideas will just drop down or more likely they'll just come up from your body and be like, oh, I was waiting to tell you, thank you for showing up to a place where it was acceptable. Um, and then we'll be covering uh, expansion, not just protection. Uh, what really lights me up is what to do about it when you've got a handle on it. And I'll explain and demonstrate how I go about reading people, how I open myself up, tune into people, allow their whole system to come into mind, and then how I express what it is I'm feeling they're feeling. How to use that in a responsible way uh, and how to have fun with it too, not to take it too seriously. Uh, growth happens much slower if you take it seriously and happens much more joyfully if you take it fun. So I like to have fun with it and play with it. Um, and what else? We'll be talking about empaths and the professional world and the real world and empaths in the political world, how to navigate this world and what we're all doing here. And I think what the class is ultimate, what I've discovered through the last class what this class is ultimately about is about community. And that's what the company you guys are doing is about. It's about community. Uh, I'm a good teacher and I really love teaching and I've learned a lot of stuff that I really want to explain. 
But actually what I'm really doing in this class is demonstrating to you that this is all possible and that we can be cool with this stuff. And I will be with whoever else signs up for this class and there will be a power that emerges just by being in the same vibrational space as other empaths. That's really what I'm here to offer. And the, the wisdom that I've picked up along the way is just to open those channels. Beautiful. Yes. And a perfect description of what happened in the last class. I just want to say that I was going to chime in and say, you know, that with you, it was a completely participatory, spontaneous, organic, sort of evolving an experiential process. And that was a very different way of experiencing a teacher student class for me. And I think Jeremy would agree. So I just want to recommend you as a, as a, a different kind of a teacher where, as you said, you allow the power of the group to kind of guide the teaching and you facilitate that. So, you know, it's, it was a very exciting experience and, and very joyous. So I wanted to just say that about the last class. Thank you, Henrietta. Uh, yeah, I, I must, you know, also agree that there is something to an online learning experience uh, that we, you and I have done this for many years, Henrietta, uh, many different classes and the kind of the best ones are the ones where you really feel like you are sharing, you're sharing a space and time, you're growing with people, you're going through things together. And I, I noticed that happened during the last class with us, David. People would be having these little synchronicities with each other in the chat box and just, you know, being able to kind of say that they went on this journey together in a way that was really intimate, in a way that you may not expect something online being so intimate. But it really was. So I definitely have to just, yeah. Uh, Jessica says this is going to be wonderful. Well, thank you, Jessica. I, I hope, hope you do register. And I want to just remind everybody that it is $25 off right now. Um, so uh, if you go to the link and, and check out, it should be, it should give you the discount there. Um, and we link that in the, in the comments section as well. Um, Tamara is saying that as an empath, we have to learn how to protect our space and energy and set clear the boundaries as to what we will allow in our space. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's a lot of what we're gonna be learning to do. I agree. Except for I don't like the have to. I mean, it's nice to. It feels really good to. You'll benefit like, a lot if you do. Yeah. But have to, eh. It's okay to suffer too. Yeah. If you don't wanna suffer as much, you wanna suffer a little bit less, then you will like learning about boundaries. But if you really like suffering, that's okay too. That can, you can take your time with it. I like how you're very specific with your language, David. You know, it's good, it's helpful because it, we can use words more discerningly. Like, oh yeah, I don't have to do anything. I can just allow what happens to happen. I picked up on that very much. In the last yeah, class. thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm militant against taking this, I say this like, Americanized work ethic thinking. Yes, me too. Into, into the world of spiritual growth. Uh -huh. I, uh, I don't like the idea that we always have to get better. And I don't think that that makes us better as fast as being okay with where we are. So I think it would be healthier to accept where we are in all of our seeming deficiencies than to um, try really hard to go to the next place. Mm. Mm. Beautifully put. Yeah, that Jennifer's... gives us a lot of freedom. <laughs> Not a freedom yes. Of yeah, we're fine. What yeah. the hell? Sometimes that's all you need to really feel better is like being, you know, being told it is okay to be where you are. You don't have to be, you know, all yeah. fixed. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jennifer's saying words are magic. That's why it's called spelling. Yes. Ah, I love that. Me too. That's I never fantastic. heard that before. Thank you for that. That's fantastic. 
yeah, Jen Jennifer is uh, tuning in in the chat box. And I want to thank Jennifer, too, for kind of being the, the silent support here tonight for this session and um, and inviting us on to the Evolve and Ascend community. Um, it's all about building the community and creating these containers for, you know, transformation, healing, connection, um, evolution. So, yeah. Um, kudos to our spirit, says, says Kimberly. Thank you. Um, all right. So if you've got any last moment questions, we've gone about an hour now. Don't want to stay on too long. So happy to have you here. Community is absolutely key. Yes, Jennifer. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. And this kind of ties in with our other, our other neuro teacher, um, reincarnation. Is there mm. anything that comes up here? Tons. First of all, I believe in reincarnation. Uh, I've gone through a past life regression and seen quite vividly a previous existence that I have that felt true enough to me that I accept it more than uh, secular materialist readings of life. And third, I have sometimes felt into people and experienced things that felt multidimensional or from past lives. Uh, I, one of the things I'd love to do at some point would be to really work with somebody who sees and experiences past lives in a way that I don't yet do and see where we, we overlap. Uh, I tend, just because it's my current comfort zone and not because I think it's better, to focus on people's emotional states in this life and in their past in this life. Uh, but I don't, there's no reason why it ought to stop there. I mean, if I could go past and visit other lifetimes that I'm hearing in my own body that I could, I just haven't done it much yet. Uh, that, that feels like, yeah, you can, uh, here's a cool thing that I learned the other day. A spiritual teacher I admire named Thomas Hubel said that the Western word for karma was trauma. Ooh. And karma and trauma are the same thing. Oh. I love that. Yeah, that's... And so in a current life, you can go through a trauma and until you heal it and clear it, you can't fulfill your destiny and or move forward on some level. In a past life, you go through something that blocks you and you take it into this life and then it's karma, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really fascinating. Cool. I had never made that connection before. Yeah, everyone's like, oh. Thomas Hubel, H U B L. The man is very wise. I, yeah, I've I, heard of Tom. I've seen Thomas before in New York once or twice. Um, so, karma and trauma is like, whoa. Yeah. I'm taking that one. But I'm giving you credit, Thomas. <laughs> and I want to also plug. Uh, Jennifer Sodini is mentioning that Daniel Ryan and, and you should do a dialogue because are yeah. you familiar with Daniel Ryan? I'm not, but I would love to take Jennifer putting me. I would love to, to play with uh, people who, yeah, who are fluent in other aspects. Oh, yeah. yeah we're going to be back. That would be very, very interesting to see you too. We're going to be back for more dialogues. Uh, there's just so many wonderful people we need to put in the same virtual room together. Um, but yeah, Daniel Ryan is, is, uh, one of our neuro teachers too. And he did a live stream with us um, about a month or two ago uh, about past life regression. We're going to have another one of those next month as well. So we're going to have to get everybody together. Oh, I, um, this. I mean, and I would love to, to see if I could tune into somebody's past life and how that would match with somebody else's vision. And um, yeah. one thing I'm teaching again by osmosis, although I'll articulate it now, is just a willingness to be wrong and screw up and play around and, offer my talents as they are for whatever shows up and just like, oh, that didn't work. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're all experimenting. Yes. So here's, I think, one more question we've got. How does this all relate to archetypes? Do you believe in archetypes? Um, I want to ask what you mean by archetypes. Uh, there are in the sense of the trickster or um, 
the priestess or the emperor or the magician. I really do relate to these archetypes. Um, the shaman is an archetype. And I think it can be useful to understand people in the context of an archetype. People have a predominant archetype. Um, like there's a warrior in me somewhere and I feel him come alive sometimes, but that is not my primary archetype. Would you want me to lead you into battle? Maybe not, but would you trust me if you were having a breakdown emotionally and you wanted guidance? You probably would. That's the shamanic archetype that you're seeing in me just intuitively. So another thing to say about archetypes is when I tune really, really deeply into people, I come across this core quality, this natural way energy and emotions want to flow in their system where it completely unblocked. These core inner lives that's like at the center of people does not map clearly onto these other archetypes as like the trickster. They feel more like you're somebody who is at your best when you are doing 50 different things and bouncing all over and extremely high energy and really playful. That is a personality type on a really, really deep level. The person as they're sitting in front of me might not look anything like that, but when I tune into them, I see that. And when I describe people in that way, there's almost always this feeling of deep recognition, like, ah, they can relax. Um, so like, as I tune really into myself, I have a very calm, still, centered, like, that's me. And that's like what I'm here to do. And I can come back to that place the more I heal myself and the more natural it is. That is not everyone. Some people are going around with this incredible sense of wonder, like, oh my God, this is amazing. And their gift is to show people what is wonderful and to keep us alive to that wonder. And other people are light and fun and playful. And their gift is to bring that light and fun and play into the world. That's not what I'm doing here on some deep level. And I don't think we have choice about who we are at that level. I think what we do have a choice about is how we do the work to come back to ourselves. Wonderful. Um, so I think those are, yeah, Kim's saying I must sleep. Good night. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank and thank you, everybody. I think that's Down the end. A little bit. Yeah, I think, I think that's the end. I think Kim sounded that. I'm going to link in the chat box to the class. I'm also going to link to uh, your page, David, empath.nyc. Yes. So everybody has access to that to check out and as well. Thank you. thank you. And I have a Facebook page. Uh, which yes, let me. The empath, not my personal Facebook page, but the empath page. If you even search empath, all caps, in the search bar, you'll probably find it. Yes, here we go. And I just want to say um, that I'm really excited to teach this class. You really feel called to do it. Um, I will really be honest about what I know and don't know and where my limits are to the best of my ability. I'm really here to allow your empath what he or she really needs to come through wherever you are in that process. Um, and I also want to say how grateful I am to you who are willing to put money into this. Uh, that money allows me to talk about this stuff and do this work. Um, and thank you. And thank you, David. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight and joining this uh, wonderful discussion, this community discussion. Um, we will certainly be back again in the, in the near future, and we hope you join us on uh, March 7th when we get started and the dates are March 7th, 11th and 14th. So um, links are in the chat. And uh, once again, it's $25 off uh, for the next couple of days, till the 21st, I believe, early bird special. Um, please do join us. We'd love to have you and um, I'd be happy to answer any technical questions about the class afterwards. So thank you, David. I hope you have a wonderful night and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank and thank you, you Henrietta.
Yeah. Thanks so much. It was great being with you again. Mm -hmm. Look forward to the yeah. class. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye, Have a good everyone. night. Bye. Thanks for joining us.